Welcome back to the Gentle Counselor podcast. My name is Crystal and I support mums through their inner healing and parenting journeys. For those of you listening right now, this episode is a little bit different because back in October of 2021, it was World Mental Health Day and I had some wonderful friends join me over three days to talk all about mental health and motherhood at the Aussie Moms Mental Health Virtual Event. I hope you enjoyed these conversations, which were recorded live at the summit. I'm also thrilled to let you know that we will be returning in 2022 and plan on making it even bigger and better. It may or may not involve a retreat. (laughs) Wherever you are right now, I hope these episodes find you when you truly need it. I would love to hear your feedback on these chats, so make sure you're connected with me on social media at The Gentle Counselor. If you'd like to receive an email once a month that is full of freebies, parenting tips, links to podcast episodes, beautiful affirmation screensavers, and other goodies, make sure you are signed up to my email list. I hope you enjoy this chat. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. That is day one of the Aussie Moms Mental Health Virtual Event. I cannot believe we are finally here and doing this. I'm so excited. Thank you so much to everyone for taking the time to come in and join us today. Now, I have the Facebook group up so I can see if you're commenting along the way. So go ahead right now if you're watching and say hello so that Laura and I know that you're here with us. Um, and if you have any questions at all throughout the event, let us know. Oh, Debbie sees us. Thank you. Awesome. So even if you're watching this as a replay, still treat it like you're here with us live because Laura and I will be coming back to this chat anyway. So if you have any questions for us along the way, whether you're watching live or after, make sure you post them in the comments because we'll be able to chat with you there as well. That's the beauty of Facebook, right? It makes it really easy for all of us to stay connected. So I'm going to stop you know, yammering on. It's the first talk nerves, I think. So I'm glad it's with Laura because she's seen me be dorky before anyway. (laughs) And we're going to be talking all about how our childhood shapes motherhood, which when I saw the title, I was like, yes, yes, we are definitely talking about that. So without further ado, welcome, Laura. And can you just start by telling everyone a bit about yourself and why you started House of Fleur? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I think I was first last year as well, and we were both (laughs) nervous together. So this is good. I Um, was in the car. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But I'm Laura. Um, I am mum to one little beautiful girl, Edie. She's three, and I've got another one on the way. So I'm very out of breath. So I apologise in advance. Um, Yeah, I can't wait. I'm so excited for that next chapter to have two. Um, And yeah, I run a, a business online. I do it full time with my husband and basically what we do is we help people go low tox in their homes so getting rid of like unnecessary toxins in their products um, and swapping them over for more natural products and also um, essential oils which I'm obsessed with and I'll chat a little bit more about later but that's basically in a nutshell what I do Um, I live in Wollongong down on the south coast of New South Wales with my beautiful family and yeah that's that's my life pretty much my family (laughs) (laughs) yeah I've been following you I'm trying to remember how we connected because I know I've been following you for ages. You came to me at the perfect time and I think that's why I wanted to chat about this subject today because discovering you helped me realise that I was so wired from my childhood in the way that Mm. I went into my own motherhood journey. So I thought what better way to chat about it than with you because you helped me through that so much. Oh, I'm so glad. But it's all you. You've been very aware and you kind of already on this journey I think to begin with I think it probably started out with the low tox stuff and then you kind of realize that sort of starts to make you look inwards then I think once you start just opening yourself up to possibilities of other things that are going on in your life Um, and also Laura is how I got into using essential oils too so I've got like beautiful diffusers and you actually more so made me really aware of what's that term you like to use about the pretend organic what's that term called again um, yeah greenwashing greenwashing that's it that yep. so I love the content that you share because you're one of the few that is actually 
not about the sales. You're like genuinely wanting to share what you've been learning with everyone. And I'm constantly like screenshotting your stories because I'm like, oh, that's a recipe to try. Or, oh my God, this is like a very scary, you know, article that I need to share with my husband or something. So yeah, definitely a wealth of knowledge over there. And I like how you organize all your stories so I can like be like, oh, I want to, you know, clean my shower today. <laughs> and I just like could tap on through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a passion. Um, and I think it was all around the same time. It was when Edie was about four months old and I thought, I just want to have a healthier, better body, better mind. And I just was like, I want to get rid of the toxic crap in my life, yeah. not only mentally, but what's in my home as well. And that's kind of what got me on that journey. Mm. And um, yeah, sharing it with others now because it, it has it's made, made such a difference to just my own mental health and, yeah. and my body. And yeah. Yeah. And I think when we have kids, it's just all of a sudden like a flick of the switch goes off and you kind of just become really aware of, yeah, like whether it's the toxins in your home or how our kids are triggering us and what's coming up for us and that. Um, And yeah, it just happens with our kids. Our kids bring up a lot of stuff in us for us to explore. So how did it occur to you that your own childhood shaped your motherhood journey? I think, um, so my personality type, I have always my whole life never felt like I'm good enough. It's always been this, no matter how much success I got in my career or no matter how good I I did something, it just was, it would always flatline. I never felt like like I'd achieved something or like give myself a pat on the back and be proud Mm. of myself and fill my head with positive thoughts. And Mm. I think for so long, I was just kind of in that adrenaline mode, um, but it wasn't until I had Edie that I thought, why do I think this way? Like, why, why, why are we so harsh on ourselves? And I think so many of us struggle with the mum guilt yeah. um, and just we beat ourselves up. And for so long in my life before motherhood, I was like, that's okay. That's just the way that I am. And But I really wanted to do better for myself. I didn't want to pass that way of thinking onto Mm. my children so I really wanted to go and figure out like why do I think this way like what what has happened um me to be so harsh with myself and you know at the end of each day when I'm lying in bed at night I would think you know I didn't play with her enough today or I fed her packet food again that's three days in a row like Laura just get your shit together and you know cook us some real food like just the the negative Mm. things I would never focus on the positive things that I'd done that we'd read you know some beautiful books together or I just I was in this process of just negative self-talk constantly um and I didn't want to do that to myself anymore so it kind of like I said I found you and I think reading some of your posts kind of sparked my curiosity as to like maybe I I have been wired this way and it's up to me to become aware of it and, and rewire that um, and for me, I, I, I went to start see, start seeing someone and really work through it. And through that, um, we did a lot of role play and I would go back into my childhood um, and be that little girl again and find myself in these traumatising situations because I did have a bit of a rough childhood. My parents split at one. Um, my father... He's an amazing man, but he can be very set a high expectation. And I remember feeling as a child, like I could never meet it. I remember he would go to drop me off at my mum's of a weekend and we'd sit in the car and he'd say, you know, you, you weren't thankful enough to your stepmother or you weren't, you didn't do this good enough. And he'd give me this pep talk of right. things. Pep like talk that. of criticisms. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And it's, and it made me realise, oh, my goodness, that is exactly where it has started from. And I think on the other side, my mother having her own mental health issues, I was kind of in survival mode all the time with mm-hmm. her because I was just trying to make everything okay. And when I had that awareness of, like, this is exactly what I do to myself every day in my adult life, that's where it's come from um and it was just this big epiphany of wow like I I I didn't I wasn't born this way it was it was created in me and I think just that awareness started to change everything yeah it definitely all starts from just having that chance to explore because a lot of us are just kind of going about our day-to-day lives and then especially once you have kids we're constantly busy there's always something to do when you have kids whether it's taking care of them feeding them a million snacks trying to catch up on rest um 
catch up on housework, like the million and one things that we all know we have to do. Very rarely do we get a chance to kind of sit and be like, hmm, where did that just come from? Like, Mm -hmm. I just had this, you know, thought, like I've just sat down to rest and then I feel restless. Like I feel like I have to be up and doing something, but I'm so tired. We don't stop to think, what is causing me to think that way? Because I'm allowed to rest, right? We're thinking, oh, it means I'm a terrible mom. I'm not doing enough. I better get up, better push on, better keep, you know, doing all the things, have a perfect house, post it on Instagram. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, once you get those chances to finally have a moment of self-reflection, whether it, like you said, it's seeing a post on Instagram that kind of stops you in your tracks and you're like, huh, that's interesting. I feel like I can relate to that a little bit or that's making me think of a past experience or whatever it might be. And then of course, especially um, being able to see someone and have therapy sessions together is obviously like really ideal. Um, We don't get chances to think about it. No. And it's so important for it. Like we matter too as mums. And I think we just don't make enough time for ourselves. And I know that that can be so tricky if you've got bloody (laughs) kids running around at home. Like where do you get a moment for yourself? But um, I, and I think that's where open communication comes into. If you've got mm. a, a partner, like I did with my husband, I said, I need to go and heal this and I need yes. to work on this and you need to give me an hour to go and do that session and like come home and because you feel drained after you work through yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. To just have them on that page and understand yeah. you're doing that. Um, but also in doing that, it made me realize that my husband, the same thing that he was, was wired from his own childhood. So he also went to go and do a session because it's oh, hard okay. to, That's to do that healing and then not have them come along the way with yeah. you and understand yeah. it and understand the process. So that's been amazing for our, our marriage. Yes. And I, it's not easy for men sometimes to, to, to go and, and do something like that outside mm. the zone, but it was something that yeah really has changed the way that we parent and just the way that yeah our whole marriage has been yeah I think that's a really great point you bring up is that like your relationships are such a good indication of what your triggers are really because you're constantly like triggering each other and what I think a lot of people don't understand is and I'm not talking I just want to disclaimer that I'm not talking about like abusive or actually like significantly toxic relationships I'm just talking about typical you know grumbles that we have with each other is that when you go on to a healing process together you can actually heal better for lack of a better word right now um together so it's great to do individual therapy work but there's actually something really special that can come from being vulnerable with each other and doing it together because a lot of the times what I see happen is that one person typically the woman is the one that's on this healing journey so then all of a sudden she's like moving up Not that it's like a scale of achievement, but, you know, she's like having all this more self-reflection, observation, awareness, um, wanting different choices, different outcomes, different things. But if the other person isn't doing that, there's this huge gap that starts to form. And that's where a lot of relationships can start to fracture as well. But then if you have someone that you can either join with you and they can listen and share, um, or if you go to therapy together or they do their own, then they kind of start to like catch up and then it makes it more of like an even playing field. And I think that's something a lot of people miss. And it's hard because you can't force someone to do that either. Like a lot of us are like this and we are desperately wanting them to come with us. And we can only control what we say and what we do. We can't control what other people, you know, choose to do with their lives. But also another good thing that can happen is kind of role modeling in that kind of sense. Like once that partner sees you, they're like, oh, hey, check check out what they're doing. Like, and they'll watch you in different interactions with your child or they'll be like, hey, she just responded to me differently. Like, you know, last week she was yelling at me about the bins and this week she approached it a different way. They might think like, okay, maybe there's something to that as well. Um, yeah. Rather than people just like ending it completely. <laughs> but yeah. like I said, I'm not talking about relationships where that is the better choice so I want to make that very clear that that advice doesn't apply to everyone um because again if you're with someone that's like narcissistic or abusive there's no way that they're going to do that so those are different situations to talk about there um but yeah I've definitely experienced that in my relationship as well with my husband um he's started seeing someone individually as well I think it's almost been a year now too and it's been great and I've noticed big changes too um which is always really great to see and then 
it's good because then it allows you that space to be like, okay, now I can reflect on myself and how I'm showing up or not showing up in our relationship rather than seeing them as the problem all the time. Because I think we can do that a lot too. Um, I think I've talked before about how there was one week where I challenged myself to um, always assume I was in the wrong. (laughs) Sounds ridiculous, but it really helped. It really helped for me to tap in and be like, that's his perspective and kind of work on it that way because it's really easy to point fingers at others it's very hard to turn those (laughs) fingers around and point them on yourself I don't know if I want to try that (laughs) and like you said though if you're already traumatized by um your childhood and you're laying in bed already beating yourself up that's going to be harder to do as well you want to be able to do that with someone else safely first rather than just taking an attack on yourself so like for me when I did that it wasn't to blame myself and to absorb shame and blame it was to um probably develop a bit more empathy and understanding of their perspective right so that's a bit different there too um so what are some of the things other than going to therapy that you've done to help yourself through that realization um I think like I said with with sending Nelson he I think when you when you suggest to someone that they should go and see someone to better themselves, of course you got to be met with hesitation. Mm. Uh, I said, just do this one session for me, like please, just like even if you hate it, you never have to go again. But he mm. loved it, and it yeah. came. He was more conscious of it, so I think getting him to do that was one of the, the biggest pivotal things of us working together. Mm. Um, and I also went and saw a kinesiologist. Um, don't know. Don't know, don't know what I think there, but basically they they tap some points in your wrists and she said, you've been stressed since the womb. And again, that was very interesting. And just, again, that generational trauma and now yeah. having more of an understanding that my own parents have their mental health issues that they, you know, we don't have, they didn't have access to, to people like you and your incredible information like we do now. We're so blessed with that. Um, but it helps you understand why they kind of, parented you the way that they did and I think that was huge for me yeah and not to excuse it I think there's a very clear difference in in understanding but not accepting Mm. like understanding what your parents have gone through and what their parents and their parents like intergenerational trauma you know these people went through like famines and wars I mean really um extreme things so it makes sense that we have that in our DNA as already having stress responses like straight off the bat right Mm -hmm. um but you don't have to accept it as in it doesn't mean it's okay how you were treated there's a very clear difference there and I think you can find a lot of um peace and understanding and and maybe a little bit of empathy for what they've gone through um similar things with my parents especially my mom felt so so traumatic like I don't understand how she was still standing up and decide to have children at with how much she's gone through but at the same time I can also accept how I was treated um in not great ways I don't have contact with my mother that's it's been quite a few years now you know so I can have both those things where where you can care about someone that you love of course we love our parents like we love our family that's like built into us we wish we had great relationships with our family we wish for all these things that were different and better and I'm going to talk a bit about that more in my topic of the unnoticed grief and loss that's one of those things um and it still can impact us but then what happens is that we are what people like to call the cycle breakers so we're the ones that recognize and we go okay it stops with me And in saying that, I don't think it means that we think we're going to be magically perfect and we're not going to pass anything on to our kids or whatever, right? It's more that, okay, we're making the choice to take care of ourselves, um, to parent differently and raise our kids differently too. So there's going to be a lot of different choices compared to what we experienced growing up. And that is how the cycle breaks. So then as time goes on, you're essentially changing that intergenerational trauma to something else. Um, things can still happen to us in our lives you know I like to talk about how life is like a road and there's some small bumps and big bumps sometimes there's like lots all together that happens but it's about learning healthy coping skills through that and that's what we missed so 
there's a great quote. I'm trying to remember who it was by. Probably Gaber Mate. He's like all the rage at the moment. But essentially, when you're talking about trauma, it's not necessarily the thing that traumatized you. It's the fact that you weren't supported through it that traumatized you, which is also partly why um, people that have experienced the same thing can have completely different reactions. Um, we see that a lot with siblings, right? So a lot of people are like, I feel this way about our family, but my brother or my sister like completely has no ill feelings towards them. So that's where we have like personality and temperament, but also, yeah, how you're able to cope through things that's very different. And I think um, what we've learned now is, oh, I can see like a therapist to learn how to cope through this. I can have a supportive partner to help me learn how to cope through this. So it's also about building that positive community around you of people that you know um, are safe for you to share things with and will love you still at the end of the day. I think that's also, you know, our children show us that. That's why they can chuck the most epic tantrums with us because they know that we're still going to love them at the end of the day and we're going to be there for them. Um, so what are some of your best tips for mothers who are struggling with their own childhood wiring? I think finding out what makes you feel good. Um, for me, getting out in nature, getting in the ocean, I think things like that are just so good for your soul and making sure that you do something. You know, it doesn't have to be something like that every day, but just something small. So for me, every single day without fail, I have committed to myself to put put my emotional support oils on. Um, I have a, an affirmation card that I use every day and a lot of this is surrounding um, healing from childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, I, you know, grab, um, it's an oil called Inner Child, and I'll roll that over my stomach and I'll just say, I love you unconditionally. Oh, that's um, so nice. And just giving myself that, that self-love because I think yeah. it can take 10 minutes to just focus, be intentional on something. Um, it's such a, it can just reset your whole day. Mm. Um, and I think... I, yeah, I try to find 10 minutes within my day every single day to do that, hopefully sometimes longer. Um, and just and just taking a minute to breathe because I think that really brings us back to ourselves. Um, but I'll drop this little affirmation card in the, in the comments after this because it's just all about self-love and self-care and knowing that you're doing your best. And I think sometimes when you say those things out loud and say things in your head, that that can be really powerful. The same as negative thought. If we're constantly thinking negative thought, that can be really detrimental to our lives. If we try to try to swap that and say positive things about ourselves, then I, I, I stick things like this up everywhere so that I've got it and I've got little things on my fridge, you know, with a little affirmation. And whenever I'm going to get food, I'll just have a quick look at it and it just kind of fills your head with it, that positivity. Yeah. Um, and I think creativity as well. And that was a big part of when Edie was four months old and I started my business um, I was kind of just looking for something to put my mind to because, yeah. you know, you're breastfeeding, you're scrolling Instagram. I just thought I really need, I, cause I love to work. I love to keep myself, you know, busy. Mm. Um, and yeah, it was kind of the perfect balance because it was making my own products and using the oils to make, you know, beautiful perfumes and making, you know, my own natural cleaners and whatnot. And it gave me this sense of like, Oh, I'm making something and I'm doing something with my hands, but I'm also, you know, working around my child. And, mm. and that's, what I, that's ultimately what I wanted to do. I wanted to just be a stay-at-home mum, but have something there that gave me drive and purpose. So that was kind of my things that worked for me, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that um, people try to overcomplicate it. Like they think, oh, for me to heal 100%, I have to do like a huge list of things probably. Um, but you can't just heal a hundred percent. Like when we talk about the healing journey, that's why we say journey because it's not like, Oh, you're healed. Like, congratulations. Here's your certificate. You're no longer affected by your childhood wiring. Like as if, as you've put it so well, um, it's, these are things that I do to support myself that are just for me that make me feel good. And in the long run are actually going to do something extremely helpful for me. And so things like deep breathing or affirmation cards, I think um, people don't realize the actual like power behind it, like why we talk about that. And yeah. deep breathing we know is linked to um, people call it, what is it called? Your vagus nerve, like your, um, your, of course, like on live, I'm going to forget all the words I'm supposed to know. Your system, your regulation 
I don't know why I can't think of the (laughs) word right now. Anyway, um, and so it's about calming down your body because we think that emotions are all mental, right? But it's not. You feel it physically. Like when you're sad, you cry. When you're angry, you want to stomp your feet or, you know, punch something or scream um, or you feel hot. When you're anxious, you kind of go inward, like your shoulders tense up, like emotions are felt physically. And I think that's why I think you mentioned before that you saw a a central nervous system. Thanks, Debbie. (laughs) That's the word I was looking for. Um, And that the kinesiologist, did I say that right? I think that's who you said you saw. It makes sense. I think we're starting to respect a bit more how our body is linked in to the healing journey as well. It's not just... um, overthinking and over analyzing everything that we've been through you have to figure out things to support yourself and on a daily basis too and I do deep breathing a lot um especially in frustrating moments with my kids and I know I'm about to get triggered I'll take a moment to take a deep breath um my husband likes to laugh at me because he'll just hear me all of a sudden just really quick (sighs) (laughs) <laughs> and I didn't realize I was doing it for the longest time until he brought it up and our kids do it now too. <laughs> I didn't realize that was like my automatic thing that I was doing to calm myself like really quick. Um, now I try to be a bit more mindful about, you know, taking a deep breath, holding it. And it's all about the out breath being slow. Um, you know, Laura and I took a deep breath before starting this chat. It just kind of gives you a your body a second to relax physically for your brain to be like oh okay we're safe okay now we can like think a bit more clearly um and we talk about this with our kids we just forget that we can do it with ourselves yeah we forget like that's the kind of thing that we teach our kids but then we forget like oh I need to actually figure out ways to calm myself down because we're just so focused on them the whole time and things like affirmations that's like um linked to neuroplasticity I almost didn't say the word that time. Um, so if, if you're exactly right. If you keep thinking the negative thing all the time, your brain just believes it as truth. And mm-hmm. if you start replacing that with positive things, that's like the new truth. So what you're doing is essentially creating new wiring in your brain, like quite literally. Um, so that's why it can feel really weird and really strange when you first do it. But the more you do it, the easier it comes to. It doesn't feel as weird. And then in the long run, it's all about the long-term benefits, short-term things that feel good is like scrolling aimlessly on your phone. I do it too, not judging at all, but that's what we call like an unhealthy coping mechanism. It's not actually going to help us in the long run, right? But doing things like going to therapy, um, saying affirmations, you know, practicing deep breathing, a bunch of other stuff I'm sure we'll talk about throughout this three-day event is actually going to benefit you in the long term. Um, And that's how it also will uh, be a benefit to your children because we're going to be role modeling these things. Um, And, you know, that's the whole goal too, is like, it's hard because as the cycle breakers, we've got the job of two, unfortunately, we've got the job of, you know, working on ourselves and also supporting our kids. And I think there's also like a frustration in realizing that you're like, oh, like now I have to be the one to do it. And I think that's part of that upset because you're like, oh man, if I just had my parents do this for me, how different, how different could things be? Um, so that's like the unfortunate reality. I don't like to sugarcoat it with people. It's like, yeah, it sucks. It does suck. It yeah. sucks what you've gone through. It sucks because you couldn't choose your parents. Of course you wish you had parents that treated you a bit better. Um, it sucks that you're the one that has to reparent yourself at the same time as you're parenting your children. But what's great is that our positive changes is going to live on for like the generations coming after us. So there's like a beauty in that as well. Um, yeah. I feel yeah. like I just went all. No, I loved all of that. And I think just knowing that it is, it's a forever process. You can't mm. just do this once and then think that it's going to help. Um, and for me, I'm such an inconsistent person. So I really struggle <laughs> with routine and like putting things in place, but I read a book once and it said, if you do something for 30 days, it will create a habit. And I was like, okay, right. Just for this month, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to do it every day. And it really did. It just became the norm that I would you know, yes. wake up in the morning and either do it at that point. Um, so try something for 30 days. If you really want to like learn meditation and, and just set yourself a goal of like, right, I'm going to do it 15 minutes every day um, and just set yourself that 30 day goal and yes. see that it just like becomes second nature. Yeah. Um, Time is going to pass anyway. Yep, exactly. May as well give it a go. And I think for people like us as well that are, that struggle with being inconsistent, we can blame ourselves when we don't do it, right? So it's also about how can I 
support myself and set myself up for success. You know, the reason why you got through school, for example, or did team sports was because someone else was like running the schedule for you. And then what happens is you're thrown to adulthood and you're like, oh, I'm supposed to somehow do that for myself now. So that's why you need to like schedule it into your phone, um, set up alerts. Um, for me, I've realized that um, I probably lack object permanence or something because I need to have it like really in front of me, like something I will be stopped to see and do. So like when I do my journaling, I have it near my kettle in the morning. So when I'm you know, putting the jug on to boil, I see my, my journal. I'm like, okay, I can quickly do journaling for like two minutes because time's passing anyway. Everything's happening anyway. I may as well quickly take this couple of seconds for myself. It makes such a big difference. And then I'm so annoyed at myself on the days that I might not do it. And it's like, no, no, because you just do it again. You just try again until you eventually get there. And each time you're going to feel good about it. And that's the goal, right? Yeah, and I think even if you do do it that day, you'll find that yourself thinking like, oh, I'm so proud of myself yes. for doing that. Um, Positive and- self-talk. Yes, yeah. you do, and it just automatically happens. Um, but one other thing I do that is quite funny, Nelson caught me doing it the other day, is I think when your central nervous system is so in you know action all the time and you feel a bit tense, I love to put on a song and just like get rid of the stagnant energy. Yes. And- dance in like the most ridiculous way like whatever feels good (laughs) um and just I just feel so much better after that my body like it's just kind of released all that yeah crappy energy that I had in me um but you know how fun is that for your inner child as well I do the same thing I love it when I'm home alone and I'm like blasting music and it's like old school music that I grew up with yeah and I'll just like go to town it's like yeah. so much fun or it's even like singing like for me singing is probably a big one that I was doing in my car um so you know if ever you catch me in public singing feel free to awkwardly be like Haha, I saw you in the car but I've done that before especially after um long days at my previous job as a school counselor which were very draining especially emotionally draining oh man sometimes I would like scream and belt out those songs and you feel so much better after I think we yeah. forget that like music and movement movement doesn't have to be like going to the gym like you can dance you can just go for a walk you can stretch you can just do whatever feels good for you in that moment we don't need to overcomplicate it it is just picking those moments like I feel like doing this right now and then doing it <laughs> yes yes and get your kids involved I think if you stuck at yes. home today with a toddler and there's a song that makes you feel good and you want to just like go do whatever to it like get them involved and they'll see you that like oh mum can do that like maybe that's something I can do as a coping mechanism yes um, so I always do that with Edie and yeah Benji. I I need to get back into doing it again I stopped for some reason the kids and I almost had like a dance party every day for a while there um and particularly in the afternoon you know like that witching hour time when everyone's grumpy it was like such a good way to just kind of boost everyone um and Sarah's just said in the chat that there's a whole bunch of research about how animals literally shake off a fear stress trauma and how we can dance or shake to release the nervous system yeah and following some accounts I know Tiffany Rowe is one account that I follow that does this a lot like she's constantly like dancing she looks really good doing it though so I'm like hmm one day I'll post when I feel like I look good (laughs) dancing around I I probably should just do it anyway like who cares that's the whole point isn't it it's just to encourage everyone to do it so now you're going to see on Laura's and my account we're going to have dance parties now I'll just do it. it. <laughs> I don't know if anyone wants to see my daggy dance move. <laughs> I think you shared it once and I was really impressed with the booty shaking. I'm sure there was one time. I think so. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, Laura, it's been so great chatting to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to Thank come and speak to us all today. And like I said at the very beginning, if you're watching this live or as a replay, still feel free to leave any comments and questions down below or if you just want to have a chat with us, because we'll make sure to come back to this um, because the replays will be staying up for a little while as well. But before we go, uh, Laura, can you tell everyone where they can get more of you and see the dancing? (laughs) Yes. I would love to meet you all and say hello to all of you. Um, I am over at house of Fleur with an underscore at the end on Instagram. Um, And usually that's where I'm hanging out. That's the only place I hang out. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) that's where you can find me. Awesome. Thank you so much. Love you. You're one of my favorite people ever. (laughs) Bye. Thank you. Bye.